Hi, David. Hi, Sean. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm great. I just got back from my summer vacation, actually. So I heard. I hear you had a nice time. Yes, it was very good. We were in Vegas. I don't know if you saw um, some months ago I blogged about a feature that appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, I didn't see this, uh, they had the clever idea of asking a bunch of academics what their guilty pleasures were. <laughs> and uh, so they, I, they, I was one of the ones they asked, and I was, uh-huh. I was really expecting to be humiliated when the results came out that my guilty right. pleasure was not nearly as salacious and shocking as everybody else's. I just said <laughs> that my guilty pleasure was going to Vegas and playing poker. But, uh-huh. in fact, I had far and away the most salacious guilty pleasure of all the <laughs> academics. They were The rest of them were like landscape gardening and <laughs> learning new foreign languages were their guilty pleasures. So, Good for you, Sean. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm, I'm way out there on the curve, right. <laughs> Okay, so I think that today we agreed to do a little experiment with our blogging head and um, not ramble around and talk about whatever comes into our minds, but actually focus on a single topic. That sounds good. And we picked the best possible topic, which is quantum mechanics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've written a book about it, and I'm a scientist, so there should be plenty to talk about. Good. And so I thought, and beyond that, we haven't really planned out that much about what um, the agenda is going to be and so forth. So I thought that uh, my guess was that my definition of quantum mechanics is probably uh, not as careful as yours is. <laughs> so I'm going to start by giving my definition of quantum mechanics, or what I think it is informally you know, for people who are not experts and don't really know Good. physics very well. And then mm-hmm. um, you can respond to yours, and then we can go off and running about cleaning up the issues and the misinterpretations and so forth. Great. Okay. So... My, when people on the street ask me what quantum mechanics is, my very shorthand version is to say that the major thing that, that is important to know about quantum mechanics is that it says that what you can observe about the world is different than what actually exists in the world. The reality of the world is not amenable to complete and unvarnished observation by us. Uh, so more specifically, when we talk about quantum mechanics, we contrast it with classical mechanics, the theory that came before quantum mechanics that Galileo and Newton and their friends and their enemies uh, helped figure out. And classical right. mechanics, even though many of us struggled with it in high school or college or whatever, it, it really does make intuitive sense. It, it fits in very well with how we think the world works. It says that there are things in the world, there are systems or objects, and these systems each have states. They, they come in different um, arrangements and configurations, and you can say what they are. And the state of the system is basically everything you need to know to figure out right. what the system is going to do. So if you have right. a baseball, then the state will, will tell you where it is, its location, its its velocity, um, its orientation in space, if it's spinning and so forth. And then if you knew the state of the baseball and the state of everything around it, and you knew the laws of physics, you knew the forces that were acting on it and so forth, you could use the equations of the universe, Newton's laws, for example, to predict where the baseball would be at any time in the future and where it had been any time in the past and so forth. Right. Let me, let me just jump in for a second sure. to separate two, two distinct things that you said. Um, one is that um, there is some determinate matter of fact at every moment about what the state of everything is. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the second is that the way those states evolve in time is deterministic. Yes. Um, we could certainly envision having a theory that had the first of those properties but not the second, for example. That's right. Okay. Yep. Uh, a theory in which there was always a perfectly determinate matter of fact about what the state is at any moment, but where... Uh, the the laws of evolution in time where the dynamical equations of motion were chancy rather than deterministic. Yes, that's true. You could okay. imagine that. And Good. we could also, for that matter, just to be complete, we could imagine laws that let you predict the future given the state but not predict the past or retrodict right. the past. Right, absolutely. There, there are all kinds of combinations. Okay. In Newtonian mechanics, as you say, we sort of have the maximal Situation. That's right. Yes. Um, the states are perfectly determinate at any time. Moreover, the way they evolve from the present into the future and into the past is all fully deterministic and symmetrical 
and so on and so yeah, forth. The clockwork universe. Right. Which then crumbles in the early 20th century when we invent quantum mechanics. And uh, so the way that I say what quantum mechanics says is that quantum, according to quantum mechanics, there is no such thing as the state of individual things in the world. There's something which I call the state, or you might not want to call it the state, but there's something that describes the whole universe all at once. And we cosmologists call this the wave function of the universe. Um, other people use less grandiose terms. But there's some one thing, some set of information that tells you everything that there is to know about the world, the state of the world. And the real difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics Sorry, I should say a similarity is that if you know that state, then you can evolve it into the future if you know the laws of physics and evolve it into the past up to some things that I'm sure we'll get into about the collapse of the wave function and so forth. But it can mm -hmm. be evolved. It, it contains the information you need to do the evolving that you're allowed to do. Um, what, it, what the difference is, is that the wave function of the universe doesn't tell you things like where the baseball is. What the wave function of the universe does is it, it's a set of information that allows you to answer the question, if I observe the universe, if I look at it in some way, what is the probability that I will get a certain result? And for many, many examples of the wave function of the universe, that probability is not going to be either 1 or 0. It's going to necessarily be some number between 1 and 0. It's not 0% or 100%. It's some right. probabilistic thing. Hmm. We can't do any better than that. And right. so I like to say that there is no such thing as the position of the baseball. There might be a baseball, but you know, if you go into quantum field theory, it's not even necessarily a baseball, but we'll skip right. that for the moment. But the point is that it's not that there is something called the position of the baseball and you just don't know what it is. Right. It's that there is no such thing as the position of the baseball. There's a wave right. function, and the wave function allows you to figure out what the chance is that you will see the baseball in this position or that position if you look for it. And so that's... Um, yep. Let's see. I have um, one more thing to say. Oh, sure, okay. Okay. The one more thing to say is that um, the other crucial fact about quantum mechanics, I mean, I think we could all deal fairly well with that much. It's interesting and new that you don't have access to everything there is in the universe without um, probabilities entering. But then there's the one other crucial fact, which is the probably the most problematic fact, which is that when you make that observation, you necessarily change the wave function in the universe in some sort right. of irreducible way. Right. And a, a lot of times people make bad analogies to this, saying that, you know, there's a person who has a beautiful smile and you try to take a picture of them, but whenever they see the camera coming out, they lose their smile, so your mm -hmm. observation disturbs it and you can't do it. And that's, these are really bad sets of analogies. Mm -hmm. In classical mechanics, you could always imagine just doing more careful observations, right? right. You know, hiding the camera and being very sneaky about it and so forth. And in principle, up to your experimental aptitude, you have direct access to everything about the state of the world. You can measure it, and you can measure it delicately without disturbing it if you like. Right. But in quantum mechanics, it's radically different. If right. you, in a very, very simple system, for example, if, let's say we have a coin whose states can only be heads or tails. And this is obviously a very idealistic version of the universe, but right. if that were the universe and you observed it, uh, and quantum mechanics would say, well, you're only going, you're going to get an answer that it's heads or it's tails... No matter what the state was before, the state might have been such that you have a 70% chance of getting heads, 30% chance of getting tails. Right. But when you observe it and you find that it's tails, then it's in a different state. It's now in a state that is 100% tails, and every time you look Correct. at it after that, it's going to keep being tails. Correct. And you can't help but changing the wave function of the, of the universe in this dramatic way by making that observation. And this... this bothers people, and I think it's good that it bothers people, it seems to, number one, have a different rule for when you're observing things and when you're not observing things. Right. And number two, it, it, it raises the question of what constitutes an observation. Is it really right. something that involves uh, some sort of conscious perception or at least uh, you know, a living being or anything like that, or does it happen physically all the time? When right. does this collapse of the wave function, reduction of the wave packet, etc., actually happen? These are very good uh, open questions. Right.
Good. Um, let me make a couple of comments sure. on what you said. First of all, it seems to me that there's a little bit of a tension between two of the things you said a few minutes back. Okay. One was, um, um, one was you said, look, the wave function of the entire universe doesn't tell us all sorts of things about individual particles. Right. Okay. The second thing was that in many situations, th there are many situations in which there just isn't a fact, say, about the position of a certain particle. Okay. And when you said the second thing, you were at pains to distinguish that from the case of our merely not knowing something. And I think you were right uh, to make that distinction. Okay. Um, but I, I just want to see if we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. The first thing you said about the, the wave function not telling us everything sounds as if there are other facts out there which the wave function is just neglecting to mention. No, I certainly did not mean to imply that. Okay. The wave function is everything that there is. Right. Right. So, I mean, there is a state of, of uh, you know, th there is a, a, a completely objective story about what the world out there is doing, yes. um, according to quantum mechanics, no less than there is in the case of classical mechanics, as far as I can see. Um, it's just that this story is, in certain respects, very strange, okay? There are certain situations that, say, an electron can be in, where even raising a question of the form, where is the electron, is like raising a question about the marital status of the number five, um, or about the weight in grams of Catholicism, um, or something like that. It's the sort of thing that philosophers sometimes refer to as a category mistake. Right, okay? absolutely. It yeah. seems that subatomic particles can be in situations where asking about where they are just somehow fails to make sense. And maybe this is a point at which it's convenient to do away with some of the bad analogies and mythology and so on and so forth. Often you hear people say things about electrons in these so-called superpositions, um, that they're in both places or something like that. That doesn't seem like a good way to put it. Um, there are a lot of features that we expect something to have if it's in both places that these electrons don't have, like the one you just mentioned. If we go look for it, um, we would expect to find something in both places. That's not our experience. When we go look, when, when we turn on electron detectors in a situation like that, we sometimes find it in one place and we sometimes find it in another. Um, that is, as you said, um, the matter that the business of observing is in quantum mechanics apparently unavoidably a matter of doing a certain profound kind of violence to the system um, whereby we not only ascertain something but we change its state in such a way as to make the question make sense in the first place. I think that's right, yeah, and so I didn't mean to imply otherwise. When I said that the wave function, if I said that the wave function doesn't tell you where the electron is, what I'm trying to say is that that's because there is no such thing as where the electron is. There's the wave right. function. That's what there is. And what the wave function is is a way of figuring out what the probabilities would be if you observed it. So, I, And I think that, in fact, when we're teaching quantum Well, but let me, let me stop you there for a second, too. Okay. Um... Prima facie, um, that is, I want to pull the, the discussion as much as I can towards the kind of discourse that we're using in classical physics, say, or something like that. Okay. Um, um, it's a funny thing about the way quantum mechanics is often presented, that um, it's often presented as if claims about how to read off results of experiments or something like that are built into the foundations of the theory. That's a very puzzling way for a theory to be structured. Prima facie, naively, um, we don't expect it to be among the fundamental principles of a theory that it tells us things about how measurements come out. Um, what we expect of a fundamental physical theory, presumably, is that it says what the world does, 
Okay? Um, and among the things the world can do is have measurements going on inside of it. And the natural expectation would be, well, those are among the physical events that the theory is going to make predictions about. Of course, the theory will result in claims about what we can measure, what we can't measure, how measurements under these circumstances are going to come out, how measurements under those circumstances are going to come out. Um, but those are going to be theorems. Those are going to be consequences that we derive from the theory. That's surely at least the way it is in classical mechanics. Yes. And it's a surprise. It's something unfamiliar to find claims in the foundations of the theory like the wave function is a thing which predicts how measurements are going to come out or which gives you probabilities about how measurements are going to come out. That certainly is the way the theory is usually presented. Right. Um, I'm not sure I see the necessity of presenting it that way. Why not think of the wave function as a representation of what's going on now in the world? at any particular moment, okay? Um, mm -hmm. When we say, if this happens, then there's such and such a probability that that would happen, and if that happens, then there's such and such a probability that this other thing would happen, we're talking about chancy evolutions of the wave function. Right. Okay. And we say, and when we say that a measurement came out a certain way, we're saying the wave function now looks like this. Okay. The wave function of our measuring instrument and our measured system and so on and so forth now looks like this. If we put it that way, it's not any part of the definition of the wave function that it's an instrument for calculating probabilities of how measurements come out. Um, rather. The, the evolution of the wave function is the evolution of the world. Everything that goes on in the world, collisions, supernovas, measurements, so on and so forth, is coded up in the evolution of this wave function. And what we want to know in the quantum mechanical case is how the state of the world evolves, which is exactly the same thing we want to know in the classical case. Okay, yeah, I think all that's uh, very good, actually. I mean, I think it... it um it takes a problem that we are certainly going to have to confront and moves it, and probably moves it in a, in a, in a fine and, and legitimate and, and maybe even helpful way. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The, the problem is, um, of course, what, what constitutes a measurement? What kinds of evolution of the wave function do we call an observation, and which do we not? So, Well, okay, let, let's, sharpen, let, let's sharpen that up a little bit. Of course, okay. I agree with you. Let, maybe it's worth saying a few words about exactly why that's such a problem. Okay, let me, Once just, again. let me just interject that, uh, so the way that I would put it would be that the, the way that I presented it was sort of to sneak in a naive physicalist interpretation of quantum mechanics while I was presenting the fundamentals of the theory, and mm -hmm. you are, you're separating out the issues of the fundamentals of the theory from the interpretation that we're going to sort of use to match to our experience. Right. Okay, good. Um, so look, go back to the case of classical mechanics, okay? In classical mechanics, there's no urgent question of the form, what counts as a measurement, right. okay? Why not? Well, you want to talk about, talking about measurements is like talking about anything else, okay? A measurement is a certain kind of a collision, um, between one system, a system which for those purposes we happen to be referring to as a measuring device, and another system, a system which for those purposes we happen to be referring to as a measured object. Okay? But there's no need to put these names on them. We could just regard this as a collision between two physical systems. Um, we, could, you know, we could ask where post-collision the thing we're calling a pointer on system number one is going to end up, so on and so forth. But this is just like calculating where a projectile is going to land or something like that. Okay? Um, there are things that it's convenient to call measurements for all sorts of reasons, but there's nothing deep, there's nothing essential to the theory about calling them measurements. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, and we, we, we ask the theory to predict how those events are going to go, just like we ask the theory to predict how any other prosaic, run-of-the-mill physical event is going to go. Good. Why are things different in quantum mechanics? 
Here's why things are different in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we have a set of equations of motion, mm -hmm. the Schrodinger equation in the non-relativistic case. Okay? And um, we can solve the Schrodinger equation in simple cases, and we can ask of the Schrodinger equation to predict how things are going to be. For example, if I take an electron, which is in a superposition of being located over here and located over there, that is, an electron about which there fails to be any matter of fact as to whether it's located over here and located over there, and just ask the theory, ask the equations, what's going to happen if we put a measuring device designed to measure positions of electrons in front of this thing and switch it on. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is a perfectly well-defined physical question that we can ask the theory to answer for us just in the way we ask Newtonian mechanics um, to answer questions like that for us. The trouble is that um, the Schrodinger equation gives us an answer, a perfectly unambiguous answer, but the answer it gives us is crazy. Okay? <laughs> um, what the yes. Schrodinger equation tells us in circumstances like or that, if we seems switch to be crazy. Or it seems to be crazy, yes. I mean, we'll, we'll get to attempts to see it as not crazy, like the many worlds interpretation, yeah. and so on and so forth. But on the face of it, it seems to be crazy. Okay? Um, what the Schrodinger equation tells us unambiguously and with certainty is going to happen in that situation is that when we switch the measuring device on, the pointer on the measuring device, which is designed to indicate where the particle is, is going to get itself into a situation where there fails to be any fact about its location. Okay? And moreover, if a human observer comes and looks at the pointer, the Schrodinger equation will furthermore predict with certainty that that human being's brain is going to get into a situation where there fails to be any matter of fact about whether that human observer takes the pointer to be pointing to the left or to be pointing to the right. Okay? That's right. So um, let me just, let me so just to interject, in the language I was using before, after all those things happen, the wave function of the universe says that there's a certain amplitude that the electron is there and the pointer says it's there and the human being's brain says the pointer says it's there and a certain amplitude that the electron was over there and the pointer says it's over there and the human being brain witnessed it to be over there. But these both of these um, amplitudes exist simultaneously in the superposition. That's right. And let's and let's uh, let, let me just reiterate, Sean, what you said a few minutes ago. There being these amplitudes shouldn't be confused with a situation where either the electron is there and the pointer is pointing there, or the electron is there and the pointer is pointing there. Right. This is a situation in which there. rather there, well, I, even both, I think, is a, is, a, is, a, is a way to say it that can, down the road, um, be confusing. Okay. Um, um, the, 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 we're in a situation where there just fails to be a fact, like you were saying earlier. Right about where the electron is or where the pointer is pointing. We're in a situation where asking where the pointer is pointing or asking what the belief about the observer about where the pointer is pointing is like asking about the marital status of the number five. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the trouble with this is a straightforward empirical problem. This prediction of the Schrodinger equation is at least apparently radically false. Okay. We know, we know, as it were, better and, and with more certainty than we know anything in the world, because we know it just by direct introspection, that at the end of such processes, there damn well is a matter of fact, at least about where I take the pointer to be pointed. Okay. And we know that at the end of these procedures, there damn well is sense to the question, where do I take the pointer to be pointed? The Schrodinger equation seems on the face of it to be flatly denying that there are any facts like that. And like I said, this isn't a fancy conceptual problem, really. It's a straightforward empirical problem. The Schrodinger equation is denying that there are facts about those things at the ends of these processes. And our empirical experience of the world is that there are facts about these things um, at the end of those processes. So. It seems like the Schrodinger equation is saying something wrong and consequently needs to be modified. Well, you certainly, the did, you certainly did slip in some um, interpretive apparatus there. You're, 
you're identifying at the very least us or I or my perceptions with right. um, with sort of the some subsystem of the whole wave function that exists in a superposition. That's true. That's true. Okay. That is that is more prosaically. I'm I'm uh, I'm assuming. Um, identifies maybe a little too strong, but I'm assuming that there's some kind of systematic connection between um, my mental experience and the physical situation of my brain, or something like that. Well, you're doing a little bit more than that. I mean, you're allowing. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we're going to get into, I think, the many worlds and many minds issue. Right. So, um, if if after that measurement there are two different conscious observers. Uh, no, no, no. Let, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I don't mean to be foreclosing that. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. I am slipping in some interpretive apparatus. Um, before we get to that, that's a radical and beautiful proposal. Um, I, I just wanted to... Uh, no, no, you're right, and I don't mean to be foreclosing that. And I am slipping in things that do uh, foreclose that possibility, which we're going to remove later on. I just want to first... Um, sure get the listener to the point where he understands in what sense people thought there was a problem okay, good, here good. When, when it first came up. So, yes, I am implicitly supposing these associations and so on and so forth. And if one supposes all that, we've got a straightforward empirical yeah. problem. The Schrodinger equation um, predicts unambiguously that there will fail to be facts about where I take the pointer to be pointing at the end of these experiments. And my empirical experience of the world is that there invariably are facts. We feel that there is an answer, yes. That's right, that's right. Um, We feel very strongly, okay? Um, um, It's a very deep feature of our experience. This is not like feeling that, I don't know what, that a certain subatomic particle has a certain magnetic field around it. This is much more visceral than that. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a problem. What's the right way? What's the right way on the face of it as a first pass to react to this problem? Well, Schrodinger equation is making an empirically false prediction. There must be something wrong with the Schrodinger equation. We ought to throw it away and replace it with something else. Okay. Um, um, that's a very sensible reaction to this. The trouble is that in every circumstance other than we're, when we're doing measurements, the, the evidence is so abundant of the Schrodinger equation being exactly correct. Okay? Mm-hmm. That is, we, we make measurements at two ends of long time intervals. Okay? Um, um, and, and these measurements come out in such a way as to, as to give us very powerful evidence that throughout the interval in between those two measurements, the system is evolving exactly in accord with the Schrodinger equation. So we have this interesting tension. There is very, very powerful, as it were, ordinary laboratory empirical evidence that the Schrodinger equation or some relativistic generalization of the Schrodinger equation is universally true. And there's very powerful evidence of a different sort, not of the laboratory sort, but of the sort of straightforward introspective sort, that the Schrodinger equation must at least be making some predictions that are false. The way this was reacted to by the people who first understood it, people like John von Neumann and so on and so forth, was to say something like this. Gee, I guess there must be two fundamental laws about the way the wave function evolves, rather than just one. There must be one law, the Schrodinger equation, which applies in circumstances when the systems in question are not being directly observed, are not being measured, and another law which applies in those circumstances where they are being Mm -hmm. measured. Okay? Um, And this gets us to to the kind of worry that you were pointing to a minute ago. Okay? The trouble with this is that it's preposterous, okay? Um, um, not, and it's worse than preposterous just in the sense that it's saying something that seems to be very strange. It's preposterous in the more serious sense that it's not a well-defined theory at all, okay? Because as you said a few minutes ago, in order to make a theory like this well-defined, we need an exact physical definition, fundamental physical definition of this word measurement, 
Okay. Yeah, when is one um, law supposed to apply and when is the other law supposed to apply? This is say, say, that's right. That's right. And, we, you know, the word measurement is, in, is, a, is a sort of um, everyday natural language, natural language English word that doesn't have a definition on remotely the level of precision that we expect of a fundamental physical theory. There were all kinds of attempts throughout the 50s and 60s associated with names like Wigner and so on and so forth to persistify this boundary between those regions where um, uh, ordinary Schrodinger evolution is occurring and those regions where measurement is occurring. And I think the right thing to say about these attempts is that they became progressively more and more embarrassing um, as time went by. I myself remember as a very young man being at a conference where Wigner announced um, that he thought that uh, that dogs could probably perform measurements, but mice probably could not. <laughs> I never heard um, that one. Okay. And and when you hear this, you say something is really wrong here. Okay. Yeah. Um, this isn't the road we should be walking down. Um, uh, uh, we shouldn't be in the business of trying to persistify this notion of measurement. And since then a variety of different attempts to solve this measurement problem, some of which you were just alluding to, have come on the scene. Um, let me just say, and then I'm, I'll, stop, I'll stop talking and, and let you talk a little. Um, um, I think there are three general categories okay. of such attempts. One, um, the most, as it were, old-fashioned one, but I think still a very live one, um, is to, uh, is to take a slightly different approach to uh, collapses, okay? Um, not to give up the, the attempt to tie collapses to some persistification of the word measurement, okay? And just to let, and, and just to try to come up with a theory, okay? And the most interesting case of such a theory we have to date is a theory due to three Italian physicists named Gerardi, Romini, and Weber, right. um, who, have, who have added a small nonlinear term to the Schrodinger equation and added it in such a clever way that, it's a, that although its effects on the evolutions of relatively small, relatively well-isolated systems is minuscule, okay, its effects become very large in the kinds of situations that we usually refer to as measurements. So this is a theory that doesn't involve a word like measurement on any fundamental level, but which is cooked up in such a way as to, as to mimic the sorts of effects that people like von Neumann and Wigner wanted out of a collapse theory. So anyway, one of these three traditions is to... Is to well, maybe we should, make for the, people who are not familiar with it, maybe we should just... Is it okay to gloss this GRW approach as saying that, roughly speaking, very large systems have their wave functions continually collapsing in, in, yes. in some way, and then smaller systems, it would take much longer, only when yes, they come into right. contact with a bigger system would they collapse? That's correct. They, they, they posit a, a sort of very low per-elementary particle collapse rate. Right. Okay? And this has almost no effect at all on the evolutions of isolated microscopic systems. But when you have macroscopic systems where there are large correlations, okay, so that, for example, you have a pointer where either all the particles are on the left or all the particles are on the right, okay, um, be because they adhere to one another as parts of a solid object, yeah. then it turns out that just one of the elementary particles in that pointer getting hit by one of these collapses is going to yank the whole thing over to one side or another. Mm -hmm. It's a very clever theory, a simple, pretty theory. Um, um, I encourage everybody to, to learn more about it. Anyway, Part that's one thing. Part of kind of thing it's completely crazy, but it not ruled out by experiment, so what do we know? Uh, not at all ruled out by experiment, and we could have an argument sometime about how crazy it is. Right. Um, but anyway, that's one tradition. Um, a second tradition is, um, um, is one that, that goes back to, say, David Bohm, um, what's unfortunately, I think, misleadingly called the hidden variables tradition. Um, what happens in these theories is that there is no collapse of the wave function, OK? 
Okay? Mm -hmm. The wave function always evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. But the wave function um, is stipulated not to be a complete description of the world. Okay? Mm -hmm. There are other things in the world besides the wave function. There are other facts about the way the world is besides those that the wave function gives. There are these what you might call extra variables. Okay? Um, that is, when you have a wave function which is a superposition of a pointer pointing this way and a pointer pointing that way, there's gonna be, there are going to be additional variables which are going to, as it were, serve to put a little x on one of the humps in the wave function, indicating that it's the actual location right. of the point. That you would get if you looked at it. That's right. That's right. Um, so that's a second tradition. And then there's a third tradition, which is the one that you were referring to before, um, the many worlds tradition, the Everett tradition, so on and so forth. This is a really interesting tradition where the goal is... Um, so in the collapse tradition... We're sticking with the claim that the wave function is a complete description of the world, but relinquishing the claim that it always evolves in accord with the Schrodinger equation. In the hidden variables tradition, we're sticking with the claim that the wave function always evolves in accord with the Schrodinger equation, but relinquishing the claim that the wave function is a complete description of the world. Everett wanted to find a way to relinquish neither of those, okay? to assert both that the wave function is a complete description of the world and that it invariably evolves in accord with the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. That's my speech. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, now, you, uh, if you wanted to say more uh, about... It sounded like you wanted to say some more about, about the third of these traditions. Well, the, um, it's certainly true that, roughly speaking, people like me, uh, cosmologists, particle physicists, and so forth, um, none of them would describe themselves as a, a hidden variables proponent. Um, right. A few of them would describe themselves as a collapse proponent, but they've never heard of GRW, or if they have, uh, I mean, they're still stuck in, in, in Copenhagen interpretation of right. something special and magical about a, a, right. a right. measurement, and we don't right. yet know what it is. The overwhelming right. majority would describe themselves as many worlds people. So, right. In other words, they think that there's just a wave function. The wave function just evolves. And you did a you you know spelled out very very clearly how this seems at least to flagrantly contradict our experience of the world. Right. We don't seem to actually experience smooth evolution according to the Schrodinger equation. When we look at the electron, we see it somewhere. And right. we see it in a way that is not predictable in any uh, deterministic way. So right. the, the, what the many worlds people say is that that's because we are not the whole wave function or even part of the whole wave function. We are, you know, we're the, the way to understand you and me and what we see around us is as, as some branch of the wave function. Right. Right. And I think that there's uh, sort of real problems with this and not real problems with this. One of the not real problems with this, I think, is the, you know, people just sort of roll their eyes and go, doesn't that mean there's a lot of worlds? <laughs> doesn't that mean there's an infinite mm -hmm. number of things going on? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that the answer is just no. I think that the answer is that there's a wave function, and the wave function exists before and after you do your measurement, and it is an element of a Hilbert space. That's what you call this space of possible wave functions. And the Hilbert space didn't get any bigger. The wave function didn't really get any more complicated. Right. Your, That's surely right. Your own experience is just sort of a smaller part of it. Right. Uh, so I don't think but, that's... But so it sounds like you would agree with somebody who said, well, there are lots... Of, okay, there aren't lots of universes, but there are lots of U's, yeah. and, there, and there are lots of measuring devices, and so on and so forth. That's right. Yes, that's right. right. There's certainly, and, and so... They, and might, people, they, they might roll their eyes at that, too. They might, yeah, no, and, and like I said, there are um, legitimate problems, I think. But, but I, I agree with you that this is not, that this is not a real, right. that, you know, if we've learned anything from the physics of the 20th century, it's that counterintuitiveness is not a good argument. Yes, that's right. There's an infinite number of numbers between zero and one, but that doesn't stop right. us from using the real line in uh, right. our everyday lives. So... But there are so there are real problems. Um, so if if 
we are different branches of the wave function, uh, then what makes a branch, right? What distinguishes mm -hmm. one set of experiences from a different set of experiences, seeing the mm -hmm. coin heads or seeing the coin tails? Um, and, and that is one that I think where progress has been made with mm -hmm. the program of decoherence and things yes. like that. And we could talk about that. There's um, another problem, which I'm confused as to how big a problem it is, which is how do you, in this language, recover the rules for uh, governing the probabilities of getting right. an experimental outcome. If you really think right. that everything happens, right. then how do you account for the fact that very reliably in certain quantum mechanical experiments, if you do them over and over again, what you predict is a probability, and that probability is very useful and turns out to be right. 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 So, in fact, I, I, mean, I think very, in your, very, what, in your one might even say that to say that the probability is very useful is a bit of an understatement. Right. The, the, the theories getting the probabilities right is all the evidence we have in their favor. Okay, very fair. And in your book, I think it's like, I, I got confused by this because you do a great job of explaining what is on the minds of the people who believe in many worlds. Right. And right. then within one page you go, but it doesn't huh. work. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, well that's, that's, you know, the only reason to write books is to regret them <laughs> later. Um, and, and, yeah, there, there's much more to say about that now than there was, uh, I guess, almost 20 years ago when that book was, when that book was written. Um, and I, l l let me put it, th there's a lot to say about this, and this has been a very lively subject in the foundations of physics over the past couple of sure. years. Um, let me just see if I can make you more worried than I apparently succeeded in doing in the book. Okay. Um, look, he here's a way to put the question. Um, um, if the theory is going to succeed, it has to be able to answer the following questions. Suppose that I... Um, um, so let me put this a couple of ways. Here's the first way. Um, I measure, I, I, I have a million particles, all of which are X spin up, okay? Um, and I measure the Z spins of every one of them, okay? Um, ordinary quantum mechanical rules will tell us that for each of those X spin up particles, the probability of finding Z spin up is a half. Okay, so the probability of finding all of the million of them all z spin up is minuscule. It's one over two to the million. Yeah. So okay. for the people, for the non quantum mechanical experts in the audience, when we say that the electron has a spin up, so we've measured its spin in the up or down direction, and it's up, and that's because of the miracle of the wave function being fixed after we measure it. We know that if we keep right. measuring it in the up direction, it will always be up. It will never be down. Correct. But, Correct. miraculously, if we measure it in the orthogonal direction, in the in the z direction, for example, right. then we have absolutely no way of saying with certainty what it will be. In fact, what right. one mechanic says and seems to be true in the real world is that exactly half the time it will be in one direction, exactly half the time in the other direction. Right. Right. Good. Now, if quantum mechanics is true, okay, then measuring the z-spins of a million x-spin-ups and finding them all z-spin-up ought to amount to a gigantic surprise. Yes. Okay. Or here's another way to put the same observation. Um, measuring a bunch of x-spin-ups and finding them all z-spin-up ought to properly count as evidence against the truth of quantum mechanics. Okay. If we if we saw this persistently with a very large group, we'd begin to say, and we'd be right to say, something's apparently wrong with quantum mechanics. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're not getting the results that quantum mechanics predict. Right. The worry about something like the many worlds interpretation is that it's not going to be able to tell a story about why somebody who sees all the X spins up should be surprised, or excuse me, all the z-spins up, if he started out with x-spin up particles. Why he should be surprised. Let me go a little further. Here are two stories you might think of somebody telling about, you know, so a guy, a guy takes a, a, a million x-spin up particles, measures their, measures their z-spins, finds them all z-spin up. Um, um, 
the guy says, my God, this is astonishing. Somebody says, why? What's astonishing about it? He said, well, I, I, I measured all the X spin-ups. I found them all Z spin-up. You say to the guy, what is it that surprises you? Is it that there was an observer who saw all the Z spins up? No, that couldn't be it, because the many worlds interpretation predicts with certainty that there will be one observer like that. Okay. Yep. Then the guy is presumably inclined to say, no, 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 okay, I take that back. What surprises me is not that there is an observer who sees all the Z-spins up. The surprise is that it turned out to be me. Well, let, let's, again, for people who don't do the math in their head, there will be right. one observer who measures all the Z-spins up. There are right. many, 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 many more observers who measure some combination of ups and downs. Right. And you're, we're going to focus on what does the person, who, the unlucky slash lucky person who measured them all up, make Correct. of the situation? What does he make of the situation? Okay. He, sa- he wants to say, he had better be able to say, this is a huge surprise. Right. Okay. Yes. We come to him and we say, what is it that surprises you? Right. His first attempt at an answer is, well, I, I, I'm surprised that there was an observer, there was a me who sees all the Z-spins up. We say, you can't be surprised by that. Um, The theory predicted for sure that there would be. Okay. Um, The guy says, you're right. I take it back. Um, Here's what surprises me. What surprises me is that the David Albert who saw all the Z-spins up turned out to be me. Okay. But this this second claim is very hard to understand. What do you mean it turned out to be you? If what you mean is it's the you that was there before you did these measurements, that claim just isn't true. All of the observers are, are related in the same way to that original David Albert. Okay? There's no sense in which this one here is the unique original David Albert. Mm-hmm. Okay? They're, all They're all related yeah. in the same way to the original one. They're all his descendants. Okay, okay. Um, And if you say, well, no, 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 I mean the me after, well, I don't understand. There's no other way to pick out that you except to say he's the one who saw all the Z-spins up. Yep. I don't know how to tell a story of this on which it's clear what's surprising about this situation. Okay? I mean, I mean t- take another case. An amoeba is about to divide. Okay? Mm-hmm. It knows that after the division, there are going to be two amoebas. Okay? If you say to this amoeba, what do you think the probability is that you're going to end up as the one on the left? I take it the right answer for the amoeba to give is it's a stupid question. There's no fact about the probability that I'm going to end up on the left. Both of these amoebas are going to be my descendants. Both of them are going to be related to me in the same way. Okay. There's no probabilities here. Probabilities seem completely out of place here. A deterministic thing is going on. I'm going to divide. You ask me, what, what, how much would I bet that I'm going to be the one on the left? I, I, the, 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 the words don't seem to make sense. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. So you're saying that the real problem is how to account for the surprise. which would. So we agree that there definitely would be a surprise, right? Uh, if the guy believed quantum mechanics, right. there would be a surprise. That's right. Um, um, the, the question is, no, I mean, let me put it slightly differently. The, the question is, suppose the guy really believed many worlds. Yeah. Then the worry is, there's no cause for surprise here. Okay? But if there's no cause for surprise here, then this theory doesn't make any of the predictions that we think it does. And it doesn't make any, any of the predictions on the basis of which we believe in quantum mechanics in the first place. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, so I'm sure you would not be satisfied if I said, yeah, I will allow that guy to be surprised because um, there's a hu- there's you know two to the one million other people who are not surprised, and that guy's out of luck. But, the, okay, let me, let me, let me, inject a psychological right. diagnosis okay. at this point. I think that when you're saying that, you have unconsciously the following picture in the back of your head. Mm-hmm. Okay, There's a real me, and it, as it were, chooses at random among the branches. 
Yeah, I don't think I have that picture. I think, okay. Well, so. if you don't have that picture, I don't understand what's relevant about there being so many of these. Okay, so there's two to the one million um, people. And they all think right. that they're me, at least in the sense that they share my... They all are you. They all come from you. They're all your descendants. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They all right. they, and they say they have the same memories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And um, so I don't want to. I don't want to say that they're me. I think that all of them would look back at the last million measurements they did of this spin and say, uh, "Does that fit in with my expectations of what those million past measurements should have been?" And most of yes. them would say yes. And, a, and a few no, why? No, 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 no. But where did they get those expectations? It seems to me. It seems to me you're not entirely playing the game by the rules here. Here, here's the here's the game we want to play. Forget about your expectations from ordinary quantum mechanics. Uh-huh. Okay. Suppose that you believe, okay, from the word go in the many worlds interpretation. Yeah. You believe that what's going to happen is you're going to split. Yeah. Okay. There are going to be all these U's. Yes. Okay. Um, um, if somebody asks you, what do you expect? I take it the right answer is. I expect to see. I expect to see each of these things. Okay. I expect there to be a me to see that sees each of these things. And you say yes, but I mean, which one is the most is, is most likely going to be the real you? And I take it the answer is I don't know what you mean. There's no real me. Yeah. Just like in the case of the amoeba. I think that's right. So I mean, before um, the measurements. But then, but then, where are the probab- so, so then, where are the so then why why is it that I expect to see a certain frequency? Well, before the measurements, there's one me. After the measurements, there's two right. of the one million people, all of which share the meanness of me. Right. Um, and I think that they're allowed to look at, they're allowed to reflect upon those measurements that they did yes. and say, do, does, do the results of them make sense according to how they conceive of quantum mechanics? And for the overall well, you, you mean according to the many worlds interpretation? According to the many worlds interpretation, yes. And the overall right. majority of them will say, yes, those results make perfect sense to me. And some of them will be... Uh, so I wouldn't say... I, I, I don't want to be too, uh, too uh, persnickety. But look, <laughs> oh, no. let, let's, let, let's try this one more time. Um, <laughs> um, they, they, they say a, a guy sees... A guy, you know, one guy, a, a bunch of people see... 50-50 statistics. Right. Some people see 30-70 statistics. Some people see 100% spin up, 100% spin down. Um, each of them says to themselves, should I have expected this? Right. I don't know how to answer this. Each of them is certainly going to say, well, the theory does entail that there will be one or more observers who see exactly this. Um does the theory entail anything about which of these different observers I should expect myself to be? Does it entail something like I should have equal expectation that I'm any particular one of them? I don't see where that comes from. Yeah, that I think, is, uh, I don't see where it comes from here just because I don't, in the exact same way that I don't see where it comes from in the case of the amoeba. You think it's right for the amoeba to say to itself, "There's a fifty percent chance that I'll be on the left"? No, I never. And I never said that. I think that uh, before the amoeba split, there is one amoeba, and after the amoeba splits, there's two amoebas who both think that they were the same person. Uh, I think that if something like this, if this amoeba splitting happens many, many times, and th- there's some stochastic event that is associated with that splitting, that most of the end amoebas will have some probability distribution for that event, which will match the predictions of the stochastic process. So let's see. So let's see where the discussion has come to. It sounds like you're agreeing that before I do these experiments. Locutions of the form, I'm probably going to see this or I'm probably not going to see that, are completely senseless. No, but maybe they don't have the sense that you or I or the world usually thinks that they have. I think, so the difference, so I, I, I want to say that this is an issue of, of just probability theory generally, not quantum mechanics in particular. But right. the reason why I'm not quite allowed to say that is because in a sensible probability theory, you have an ensemble, and the ensemble is sort of the same before and afterward. And here, uh-huh. that's not true. Here, the ensemble only has one element, 
and then you do something, and now the ensemble has two to the one million right. different elements. Right. And so I think that the only way to make sense of it, so I, I do think it's okay before I do the experiments to say, here's my probabilistic prediction for what the outcome will be. And I think that what that means is that to a typical element in the ensemble after doing the measurements, I will typically have measured so many spins up, so many spins down. But Sean, let me, let me, let me, um, and then I'll shut up. Um, but, but let me press you one inch further. Okay. Maybe I was losing track of the conversation. It sounded like in the case of the amoeba, yeah. you were agreeing that it's just crazy for the amoeba to talk about the probability that he's going to be the one on the left or the one on the right. I'm not quite um, willing to grant that. Oh, um, okay. Okay, good. Okay. So then I misunderstood. Okay. So here, m maybe here's a place to leave it. Okay. Yeah. Um, what I think and what maybe you think too is that um, is that committing oneself to the claim that the probability talk makes sense in the many worlds interpretation is going to be the same as committing oneself to the claim that it makes sense for the amoeba. I am tentatively willing to agree to that, not having thought it through very oh. carefully. But basically, yeah, I, I certainly understand the analogy. It seems uh, reasonable, okay. prima facie. Then, so, so let's see if it troubles your sleep. To acknowledge this. Okay, we will we will see that. I mean, I certainly do believe that. Again, after the splitting, if there was some, if there was something about going left and right that had some co measurable consequences, and uh, the amoeba split many many times and went left or right with fifty fifty probability, um, then I think that there's going to be a set of amoebas at the end of the day which will say, oh yes, my my past trajectory makes sense to me from this point of view, or it doesn't make sense to me from this point of view. Or I got unlucky. Uh, right. Right. Okay, we're having trouble um, actually leaving it, aren't we? <laughs> okay, look, I think this is a good, like I say, this is a really interesting subject. There, there, uh, as a matter of fact, maybe it's just worth interjecting one thing here. There is a really interesting group of philosophers centered around Oxford University now. Um, people like David Wallace, Simon Saunders, uh, various other people, uh -huh. um, who have been trying hard to make clear philosophical sense of probabilities in many worlds interpretations, um, um, have done a bunch of really interesting things of which the discussion we've just had here is the, is the introduction to the introduction right. to the introduction. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, if I had to bet, it's not going to work. But they've done enormously interesting things, and there's a big literature there which people might be interested in. And I think even if it doesn't work at the end, which I suspect it won't, um, it's an exercise through which we've had to ask ourselves more penetrating questions about what probability means than we've ever had to ask ourselves before. Yeah, okay, which is useful uh, and I think it's a really interesting question. That's right. Okay, so we're nearly out of time anyway. We didn't. I was hoping to talk about locality and Bell's theorem and also about decoherence and uh, Hyperion. Have you heard about the Hyperion example? Uh, no, I'm not sure I have. Hyperion is a, uh, a moon of Saturn, right. which, which is not a perfect sphere. It, it's uh, right. an irregular shape. And uh, Zurek went and calculated how long it should take for the shape of Hyperion to sort of quantum mechanically spread so that there is no, as you say, fact of the matter about what orientation Hyperion is in. I see. If it weren't interacting with the rest of the world, because it's, it's, right. it tumbles chaotically. And right. the answer is very short, like, like days. <laughs> huh. And so the fact that when Hyperion is there, it seems to be in, in, a, in an orientation is an example of decoherence in action. Oh, I see. You mean this calculation is in the absence of decoherence? Exactly, that's right. Yeah. I see. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I guess I guess I have heard about this yeah. example. Yes, and this is a nice example. But so instead of doing that, since we have, um, by my clock, 13 seconds left, let's <laughs> instead, um, let me just ask you one question. Does quantum mechanics mean that uh, reality is up for grabs and we can make it whatever we want it to be? No, it does not mean that. <laughs> 
Um, although, as you pointed out in our last chat, I have been, I, I have appeared in, in movies which claim the contrary. Okay. Uh, but no, it doesn't mean I mean, you can kind um, of sympathize with, with someone who, you know, doesn't see the math or doesn't even read a lot of books about quantum mechanics. When you start talking about the fact that reality or what you observe about reality exists in superpositions and you can't quite predict what will happen and there's right. even this process about measurement and maybe our minds uh, are, in, are involved in changing the wave function of the universe. It's not absolutely absurd that you would ask these questions. Right. But right. Uh, it's important, I guess, to emphasize that even if it, even if it is true that we are, we are having some issues in identifying what it means to say our minds within right. the wave function. Right. That is, even in a view like Wigner's, yeah. the trouble is that, that what the world is going to become as a result of the intervention of your consciousness is completely determined by laws that have nothing to do with what you want. Um, they're probabilistic laws, they're chancy laws, but they're laws nonetheless. You know, maybe if we have ten more seconds... Yeah. It's worth saying that there's, a, that there's a, a, a yet more serious philosophical discussion around issues like this um, that, that comes up um, again and again in the history of quantum mechanics, which is whether the chanciness of quantum mechanics, as opposed to the, 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 the deterministic um, structure of something like Newtonian mechanics, leaves more space in the world for something like freedom of will. Right. Um, than, uh, uh, than we had in Newtonian mechanics. And there have been various actually interesting philosophers who've said various different things about that. But I think at the end of the day, and this is nice too, just as we're learning about what probability means um, from trying to work out the many worlds interpretation, we're learning something more about what we meant by free will mm -hmm. from this exercise. I think at the end of the day, um, um, if you think it through... It wasn't, the, it, it wasn't that Newtonian mechanics was deterministic that was the threat to our conception of ourselves as free agents. It's that it was law-like at all. Mm -hmm, right. um, it's not going to help if the laws are chancy, if the laws are stochastic or probabilistic. Yeah, so just because there's some probability in there doesn't, impose, doesn't give you any It doesn't do anything. It's not, the, issue isn't, the, the issue isn't just our inability to predict what somebody's going to do. We don't think dice have free will just because it's hard to predict what they're going to do. There's a line of Kant's which is, which is very illuminating here. What it is to have free will, if it means anything, if it's an intelligible idea at all, is to constitute something like a law unto yourself. Okay? Insofar as you're subject to natural laws, to external laws, to physical laws, it doesn't seem to matter much whether those laws are deterministic or chancy. So do you believe in free will? Uh, I, I, you know what? I, 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 what I would say before that is I don't know how to con coherently formulate what the words mean. Um, I suspect that to the extent that one can formulate coherently what they mean, no, I don't believe in it. Oh, okay. but, uh, but it's just not clear what they mean. Um, um, I, like, you know, that is, that's what we've been stumbling across here. It means something much more than just you can't predict what it's going to do, okay? Um, but if it means more than that, what does it mean exactly? I think it means um, that... There, there, are these nice, there are these flowery phrases of Kant's, like constituting a law unto oneself. Yeah. Uh, I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean. I think the free will but, means but that it I can does do what at I least, want, and I can do what I want. I just don't, even if... Even yeah, if yeah, sure. Well, this is the union. This is the so-called compatibilist. Right. There's a very watered-down conception of free will yeah. that comes to us from Hume, which is all it means is that, you're, you know, that your bodily motions are correlated in some way with your desires, okay? Um, sure, it's easy, to believe that, it's easy to believe that we have something like that, okay? But this doesn't differentiate us from any other kind of natural mechanical object. Usually what we want out of this talk of free will is to differentiate ourselves from that somehow. I mean, this is what Wigner was excited about in his view of the collapse, that it turned out... Lo and behold, not only did physics make no room for something non-physical, physics itself needed there to be something non-physical. 
But doesn't, I mean, isn't the distinction just that for human beings, it turns out to be useful to talk about us as if we have things called wants and desires, whereas for rocks or for Hyperion, it doesn't? Um, um, look, I, 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 think, I think the worries can be made a little more acute than that. I don't want to be pushed into defending a position that I don't wish to defend yeah. here. Um, at the end of the day, I don't, I, I don't believe in this. But look, let me, let me make it a little less silly to be worried about this than, than you're implying. Um, consider the events that go on in your head when you become convinced that, say, it's true that 2 plus 2 is 4. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's pretty important to you when that's going on to believe that you're coming to that conclusion because of the self-evidence of the truth of that proposition. You're being moved there by reasons rather than by causes. Okay? If you really try to focus at one and the same time on the nature of your belief that 2 plus 2 is 4 and on your conviction that you're just a mechanically determined device, mm -hmm. each step of which is, is caused by the previous step, Okay. Mm -hmm. I think there really is a cognitive tension. Okay. I think when we do science, um, it's important to us to think of ourselves as the kind of beings that can be moved by reason. Okay. Um, that come to beliefs because there are good reasons for having these beliefs, rather than come to beliefs as a result of a chain of physical causes. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, I think you're going to be able to make the same response to this. Yeah. But, but I think the issue can be, can be made. I, I, I don't think it's a silly or trivial issue. Okay. I'm going to bite my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a silly or trivial issue. I think that there probably is a resolution. I think that it's okay to talk in free will language without denying, yes, even if you have perfectly sure. predictable laws of physics. That's, uh, I, I, this is the Jungian view, and I think that's probably right at the end of the day. All right, that's very good. Well, thanks a lot, David. Thank you, Sean. This was fun. I'm glad we figured it all out, and people can rest easy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.